Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you today for uh, giving us this opportunity to be here, to be in your house, to be in your presence, to be on a very sacred and holy ground. Lord, today as we have this opportunity, Lord, we want to hear from you. We want to hear the words that you would have us hear. We, we want them to penetrate our hearts and spirits. Lord, we want to be better uh, than when we walk through these doors. We want to be closer to you than when we walk through these doors. We want to leave this place saying it has been good to have been in your house. And Lord, it starts right now with us giving you this time and our focus for just a few moments. Lord, there's always something that is fighting for our thoughts, that is fighting for our, our time and attention. And Lord, there's always things to think about. There's always things to do. There's always lists to draw up. There's always things happening later in the day, later in the week. And just a, for just a few moments, Lord, we don't want to think about those things. We just want to think about you. We want to listen to your words, hear your words, and allow them to transform our life. And Lord, we just ask that you would have your way with every single one of us, that you have your way with the rest of our time together throughout this service. And Lord, we pray these things in your holy, your precious, and your mighty name. And all God's people say amen. Uh, today we are bringing to a conclusion a series that we have been in since the very beginning of January. Uh, many of you know we've been looking at the book of Philippians, which was actually a letter written by a guy by the name of Paul who wrote it to a group of people just like you and me, group, a group of believers. He wrote it to a church, and we have wrote alongside him week after week. We've learned a lot of lessons about resetting some areas of our life that need to be reset, about rebooting some areas. And the way he brings it all together is kind of interesting because he talks about a subject that affects every single one of us in this room. And you'll figure out what that is once we read our text. We're going to begin in verse 11 uh, in the fourth chapter. I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or an empty stomach or with plenty or with little folk, and I can do anything. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, what we're going to be talking about today is probably jump down in verses 11 and 12. I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I got a little, uh, I guess, a confession to make. Um, confession is good for the soul. And uh, I used to be a kind of a Madonna fan. And uh, like, when I say Madonna, I mean like the 80s Madonna. Maybe not like the 90s Madonna. Definitely not the 2000s. I'm not sure what that is. But anyway, do you know what I'm saying? Madonna. I mean, dude, some of you have no clue what I'm talking about. If you, if you remember that song, Borderline, you just keep on pushing my love over. No? Okay, three of you. It was a great song. And express yourself, you know, you know, you've got to. No? Vogue. Strike a pose. Okay. All right. You probably would have hung out back in the day. Why am I talking about Madonna? Because she wrote a song that is perfect for today. And she said, I am I, 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 living in a material world, and I am just a material girl. I didn't sing that song that much. <laughs> but here's the thing. Madonna may not be right about a lot of things, but she was right about this one. We live in a very materialistic world that, that cries out to you and me to be materialistic. Do you know on any given day that you... Every single one of us in this room, you see somewhere between, you see in here, somewhere between 4,000 and 10,000 ads a day. Some of you are like, no, we don't. Yes, you do. Between 4,000 and 10,000, from the time you get in the car, you hear it on the radio, you see it when you drive every which way, on the TV, that little social media thing, right? You're like, how does it know what I'm thinking? Why is it? All of these things that pop up, that is, and what does all of these things have in common? They are telling you that whatever you have isn't good enough. That there is something else that is better. That your life will be better if you just have this thing. That newer is better. 
faster. It's going to hear. It's going to be faster. It's going to be wiser. It's going to be more efficient. It's fancier. Whatever it might be, it just it does its job. Your life's going to be incomplete until you have it. I mean, you're like, how to lose weight in seven days? Take these three pills. You're like, sold. You know, <laughs> how to be happy again? Sold. You know, it's like whatever pops up. You 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 pull them. Some of you may know this uh, story. Surely, if you if you did, you know if you went into a business ethics course, or maybe you studied a business course at some point, you may have heard this story about a banana company that uh, that opened uh, up a branch in Central America. And this was. Uh, quite a while ago, and when they they set this banana company up, they went into this this remote part of Central America, and the people there were primarily living in huts. They didn't have much, and so labor was relatively cheap in the grand scheme of things. They still paid them a decent wage, but there was plentiful options to get people to work. And so the banana company set up shop, hired a bunch of people. And something happened that they never anticipated or never could have planned for. After all of these people got their first paycheck, after several weeks of working, the majority of them quit. Because they had never seen so much money. They had never had so much money. And all of a sudden they realized, I can live off of this for years to come. And so they quit. So all of a sudden, the banana company's like, what are we going to do? We have no laborers. So they got together, the executives got together to figure out a plan. How, what are we going to do? They couldn't figure anything out until somebody had a brilliant idea. And let me tell you what they did. They started having sh um, shopping magazines. And they started having all kinds of ads and, 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 and various basically shopping catalogs sent into the villages and they were poured in by the box loads and people all of a sudden saw what it is that the rest of the world is enjoying they saw what it was like to have a, a sweater or what it was like to have these shoes or this or that or whatever it might be and all of a sudden it, it didn't take very long they started ordering things from this magazine and realized their money does not go very far and one by one, they started going back to work so that they could make money to order all these things that they saw would make their life complete. Now, here's the thing. Some of you think this is pretty wrong, don't you? But can I tell you something? This is exactly what happens to you and me every single day. We are bombarded with things that are dangled in front of us. And so it's like, if you will work harder, and make a little bit more money, you can spend that money. Because you've got to have this thing to be complete. You've got to have that thing to be happy. It's the same tactic. We're bombarded with images of better and more. Proverbs 27, 20 says, the eyes of man are never satisfied. You and I are never satisfied. It's the reality. We, how many times do we buy a new car and it's like, well, we're immediately looking for, oh, oh there is a new remote coming out. We, we, we get a house, and then HGTV's ruin that for us. There's always going to be a nicer house. There's always going to be a nicer kitchen. There's more shiplap or whatever it is you guys like. <laughs> there's, always, there's always better. And Paul says, be content. Paul says, be content. Now, let me tell you something. It's not just the ads and commercial and commercials in the magazines that the things that are dangling in front of us that make us discontent. We have another, we have another issue. I don't know if you knew this. It's not just the, the, the constant things that are being in front of us. We have another issue. And I'll tell you what that issue is, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example first. Last month, I was on a flight to Florida for the weekend. And um, I, I, flying down, we had three seats. I was in the window seat. My buddy was in the middle, and then some random dude is in the aisle seat. And the stewardess was coming by with a snack tray. How many of you like the snack tray? I mean, it's something to look forward to, right? And she comes by, and she goes, peanuts or cookies? We all know the choice here, right? And they're not only, they're not only going with their cookies, they're some of my favorite cookies. And they're, you know, they got two in a pack. It's lovely. Some of you get, you know, okay, some of you are smiling. Good, good. You're in this one, right? 
And she goes, peanuts or cookies? I say, cookies, of course. My buddy here goes, I'm fine. I'm like, what an amateur move. You get the cookies for me, right? <laughs> you always take it. You can eat it later, right? I mean, anyways, we'll deal with that one later. And the guy in the aisle goes, cookies. And he goes, can I have an extra pack? Of course. And she pushes the car down. My entire flight was ruined. <laughs> I have two cookies. He has four. I'm like, I'm like, really, I'm angry at him for not getting the extra pack for me. And now I'm very frustrated because why does he have four cookies and I have two? Five minutes goes by, ten minutes goes by, and I am just staring at this guy. I'm just staring at him watching him enjoy his biscuit cookie, whatever thing it is. And I'm just waiting, and I'm looking, where is the stewardess? 20 minutes goes by, and my, I'm longing to figure out what's gonna happen next because I'm praying to God Almighty she comes back by, and maybe, just maybe, I can get an extra pack of cookies. Anybody else stress out over this stuff? <laughs> So she comes back by, and I said, ma'am, I said, would it be possible to get another pack of cookies? Of course you can. And she hands them over to me. I said, you know what, you better make it two packs of cookies. She goes, of course you can have two. And I have my two, then I had, I haven't opened it yet, by the way. And just like that, I had six, he had four. <laughs> he didn't show that it bothered him, but I'm sure it ruined his flight. <laughs> what am I talking about? I'm talking about this issue that you and I have. It's called coveting. I, why? What was my problem? I was upset that he had four and I had two. This is like a child. You know, have you ever given a kid a snack and like, well, they have more than me. They have more whipped cream than I have. No, we both have the same amount of whipped cream. It's like the littlest things ever. But don't even act like you don't do the same. We all have this issue of coveting. It's when other people get something that we don't have. To covet simply means to long for something or lust for something, to desire after something that either belongs to someone else or that you don't have. That's exactly why, what happened with the cookies. And we covered a lot of things, guys. We covered other people's homes. We covered other people's cars, their boats, their shoes, their purses. We, we covered their iPhones. They got a nicer phone than us. They've got, a, they've got, we covet their spouses. We'll covet people's husbands. Look at Facebook and we'll look at them. And we'll covet their wives. We'll covet their children. They'll come, we'll covet their lives. We'll look at their success, we'll look at their status, we'll look at their position, we'll look at the trips that they're taking, we'll look at their life, and we'll look at their looks. I wish I looked like that, I wish I had what they have, I wish I had their personality, I wish I had their talents, and look, we can just keep going on and on and on. We are constantly surrounded by pressure to be discontent, guys. To do the exact opposite of Paul said. Paul said to, to, to feel content in these situations. And so before we go any further, I, I gotta say this. Contentment doesn't mean that we shouldn't work hard and desire things. That, that's, not, that's not what the Bible is getting at at all. You should work hard and go after things. You should want better things for yourself in, 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 in a sense of bettering your situation and pushing hard and going after life with effort. The Bible says that whatever you do, work at it as in to the Lord. Being content is not, is not, that's not what it's talking about. Being content is embracing the place that you're in. In other words, saying that, God, you have me in the right place at the right time. You have dealt me the situation that I'm in, and therefore I praise your name. Why? We've said it a thousand times. Because God is good, therefore it's all good. It, 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 because of wherever you are and whatever the house situation is, wherever your living situation is, whatever your car situation is, whatever your career situation is, whatever your relationship situation is, 
You, you either embrace the fact that God is in control of your life or you don't. You see, the, the issue of discontent and company, it's a very big deal. They go hand in hand. As a matter of fact, it made the Big Ten. You know the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments? Exodus 20, verse 17, you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Why is coveting such an issue? Well, the answer is actually all throughout the Bible. God knows, he knows, that, that, an out, that the outward sin begins as an inward sin. And I want you to hear me say that. God, he drills this about the word, that, that outward sin begins as an inward sin first. God knows that the sins of the hands, the things we do outwardly, begin as sins of the heart. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19, from the heart come evil faults, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, or slander. Now, I want you to notice these things that we just read. Those are all outward sins. Those are all outward sins, right? But what Jesus says is, yes, they're outward sins, but guess where they come from? The heart. It's where it all starts. It's why Proverbs 4, 23 says, guard your heart. Guys, this is one of the most powerful scriptures in all the world. Guard your heart. Why? Why should you guard your heart? For it determines the course of your life. Well, what you've got going on in here and what you've got going on here is going to determine how things go. This is why so many of the things that we've addressed over the last several weeks with Paul. Paul writes over and over again. So many of the things he addressed, the words, the actions, the attitudes, it, it all came back to what? The heart. It all comes back to what's going on in, on the inside. We've said this. When people are their oh-so joyful selves, and they are, they are those negative, nasty people, it's because of what's going on on the inside. And this is what Paul is getting at. And God gives a stern warning about coveting, about greed and discontent. Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, 12, 15, be on your guard. What are you going to be on your guard against? All kinds of greed. The apostle Paul wrote over in 1 Timothy, look at this in chapter 6. For we brought nothing into this world, we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Here he is saying it again. Those who want to get rich fall into all kinds of temptation and trap and the foolish uh, things and harmful desires to plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from their faith and pierced themselves with many grief. Ah, you know, you always, I don't know about you, but I've heard the term more money, more problems. You know, you know I, I'm like, you know, how many of us think, well, if I had more money, I'd be a lot better. Sometimes, and sometimes not. Sometimes more things create more stress. I mean, sometimes, as the Bible talks about, it, it pulls us into areas that we don't want to be in. So let me give you some biblical examples of, of how discontent and coveting destroy, can destroy our lives. I'll just give you a few. Let's just, what about Eve? That's a perfect example. If you want, we can just stop with Eve. Because in the very beginning, Eve lived in perfection. I don't know about you, but you put me on like an island in perfection. If I really feel like I'm not going to mess that up, I would. Eve shows us that we would. She was literally in paradise. And she wasn't content with perfection. Some of you are like, you're looking at your spouse, you're married to perfection, you're still not happy, right? <laughs> Eve had it. David wasn't happy with one woman. He wasn't happy with one woman. And the result was disastrous. Absalom, he, he coveted his father's throne, and the result that followed was a disaster. There's a guy um, by the name of uh, Gehazi. Yo, you know that guy. You were like, I studied him yesterday. No, you didn't. It's okay. But he's a really, he's an interesting dude. He was the, um, he was the assistant of the prophet Elisha. And there's a, a setting in 2 Kings, I'll just give you a quick version of what happens. The prophet heals this bigwig, this, this general, 
uh, and, and, he, and, he, and he heals him of leprosy. And so th this, <laughs> this big deal, he, he, his name was Naaman, by the way. He says, I, I'm, I want to hook you up. You, have, you just healed me of leprosy. I'm going to give you tons of money. I'm going to give you property. I'm going to give you everything. It's, it's, it's what you would do, right? You're so happy. Somebody just fixed you. You just want to express gratitude. And Elijah says, I don't want any of it. I don't want money. I don't want property. I don't want any of it. Well, the Hazai sneaks off behind Elisha's back and watch what he does. Look at verse 22. My master has sent me. He has changed his mind. And he would like two talents of silver and two sets of clothing. So his assistant comes back and he's like, he, Elijah wasn't thinking. He wasn't thinking. He, he definitely wants some money. He definitely wants some goodies. He, he, I'm here to collect it for him. And he, he actually, Gehazi takes it and he, and he hides it in his house. He's going he's gonna to keep it for himself. Now, watch what happens. Verse 26. And, and is this the time, this is what, what uh, Elisha would say to him, was saying to him, is this the time to take money or accept clothing, olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, manservants, or maidservants? Because of your greed, Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence. He was leprous as white as snow for the rest of his life. Discontent. Coveting. It's bad. It's an issue, guys. We will do some things that aren't on the up and up to get what we want sometimes. When you desire something so bad, and this is why the Bible warns you of this, is it will make you step into some areas that you don't need to step in. God calls us to live in genuine contentment. But I'm going to tell you why he calls us to do this. Why Paul is pushing on you and me. And in case you fell asleep, this is when you ought to wake up. Because this is the important part. The reason why God really pushes on the coveting thing, why it's in the Big Ten, why Paul is addressing it now, is because God knows that when a follower of him, when a sold-out believer of Jesus Christ is fully content, it is near impossible for Satan to seduce and to sin somebody who stands and says, it's okay. My God is God. And I'm covered. You see, a fully content believer of Jesus can stand in season and out of season when things are good and when, when it's bad, when you're hungry, when you're full, when the bank account looks good and when the bank account looks bad, when life is great and when it is horrible. A fully devoted, content believer in Jesus stands firm in all situations and says, it's okay. That's what Paul's getting at. That you and I, as he's bringing this all together, he's like, you need to be able to stand firm and realize who your God is, regardless of where you are, and trust that he has got you covered. You, Christ showed us this. You know, Satan tempted him in Matthew, uh, the, the, the fourth chapter. Again, the devil took him up to a very high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you will just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away from me. In other words, what he was saying is, I am satisfied with what God has given me. I am satisfied with what God the Father has chosen for my path to look like. So devil, leave me. The Apostle Paul, what did he say? 2 Corinthians 6.10, I regard myself as having nothing but possessing all things in Christ. So as a result, look at the look at verse eleven in the in the fourth chapter. Wherever I find myself, I have learned to be content. I want you to see this. So when Satan comes along and says, "Hey Paul, I'm going to take everything away from you, lest you serve me," Paul can look at Satan and be like, "Go ahead, I got nothing." Satan comes along and says, hey, Paul, I will give you everything, anything and everything you could possibly want if you will serve me. Paul can say, go ahead. Go ahead. I have everything I need because I have Christ. What is the old devil going to do with a person like that? 
And see, this is where you and I have got to get to this point where we can stand firm and say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Either way, I'm going to praise his name. The, the Lord is good. So it's all good. How do we get to this point? How do we cultivate a higher level of contentment and a lower level of discontent? Well, we've got to understand two things before we make this make sense. And I promise you we'll get there fast. The first is this. God decides who has what in this world. I wish I had time to really go into these two things, but you're just going to have to trust me on it. The Bible makes it very clear, and we know this, that God determines who gets what in this world because he's in control of everything. And so the second truth of this is this. God makes this decision, that is, on who gets what and when and why, based on his sovereign knowledge of knowing, and I, I might even add this word, doing what is best for you and me. Now, this is important that you understand this. When we shake our fist at God and we're so angry because we're not getting what we want, God makes the decision on who gets what in this world, and he bases that decision on knowing and doing what is best for us. So when we covet and when we are discontent, we accuse God of not doing what's best for us. We accuse God of holding out on us, on running our life in a substandard way. So if you want to be content, we need to trust that God, God has given you and me the best thing for us at this moment in time. Because, you've heard me say this a thousand times, if he wanted you to have something better, he would change it. Now, a lot of times we don't like that. We, we don't. And, that, and this, is our, this is where we have a problem with all of this. Is because we don't like that. But the truth is, is that I, I really wish that I could push on this a little bit because we've got to understand, if God wants something changed in your life, he'll change it. If God wants you to have a different house, he'll give it to you. If he wants you to have a different car, he'll get it to you. If he wants you to have a different job, he'll open up the door and you will have that job. If he wants you to have a different zip code, you will have the different zip code. He, he can get you there even if it's by the belly of a whale. He will get you where you need to be. So, if we can comprehend this truth, then we've got to take the second part. And I want you to hear me say this. We've got to trust that whatever it is that we're coveting, whatever it is that we're desiring that, that has made us so discontent, hear me say this, is if we got it, we've got to trust that if we received it, it would actually be a step backward and maybe even a disaster in our that's why you don't have it. Why can't I have that job? Because <laughs> I'm looking out for you guys. Says. Why can't I have that house? Well, because I'm looking out for you. Why can't I have that car? Why can't I have that boat? Why can't I have that relationship? Because <laughs> he says, I'm looking out for you. How many times have you said, oh, I wish that I had that relationship? And then you, know, you're, then you see him 15 years later and you're like, yes. <laughs> because he knew what he was doing. You know, they're just like, I had a guy six months ago tell me that he was so distraught because he, he goes to the church here. He was so distraught because he, he didn't get this job. He wanted this contract. He needed a contract to be renewed. He didn't get this contract. He was going to, all of his cards would have been here. He was going to take, he was going to move. Everything was set and it fell through. And what was crazy was he was mad for literally like four and a half, bitter. And do you know that company went under after three and a half months, completely done. And God watched out for him. And he said, you know, I learned a valuable lesson in that. that really, he realized just the truth that God knows what he's doing. And so this is why David would say in Psalm 16, 6, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. What David is saying, God marked off the portion of the field that makes that, 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 that is best for me, and I'm okay with that. David's life wasn't peachy. We know that. David's life had a lot of ups, and David's life had a lot of downs. But David always held to the truth that God was doing what was best for him, that God was allowing things to come and go, that, that the ups and downs and all of it, that when the dust settled, that he would be in the best place that God wanted him to be. It's why David, at the end of his life, could say in 2 Samuel 22, 
As for God, his way is perfect, and the word of the Lord is flawless to me. I want you to hear me say this. As a follower of Jesus Christ, every one of us in this room, as people that, that follow Christ, I promise you that when you get to the end, that, that your testimony will be the same, that you can say that God has always been good to you, and that his, trust, that, that his choices for you have always been best. You've got to trust that. You'll be able to say in every situation that he's been flawless. You see, tough. there are times, though, tough times, that we don't understand this. And when we come to the reality that God is doing what's best, there is such a freedom and satisfaction that are coming to this point. Paul's words in Colossians keep coming up. I want to read them to you. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. One of the greatest things we can do is shift our focus. Because when we shift our focus, guys, it becomes not about what, what I desire, but what God desires. Not what is best for me, what is best for Him. It, what, it, what, what does he desire in my life? And when we take our time, our talents, our energy, our money, our efforts, our everything, everything we are, and we say, God, you're the one who gave it to me, so therefore I give it to you. You do what's best for me. Then you will see the results. When you look at the greats of the Bible, people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, Moses, David, Job, Daniel, Paul, Ruth, Esther, Mary, they all had a, 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 a different attitude. They were different. And see, I mentioned those people, and some of you are like, I'm, I'm nothing like those people. I'm nothing like those people. But here's the thing. You can be. We all can be. Because the only difference with them and us is their foundation, their outlook was different. Abraham left Ur, the place he knew, everything he knew, and followed God in the middle of nowhere. Why? Hebrews 11.10 tells us why. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Abraham had his affections set on eternal things, not the world. Moses, he, he could have stayed in Egypt. He could, have, he could have enjoyed a passing season of pleasure, but instead he decided to suffer with God's people. Why did he do that? Still in Hebrews 11.26. He was looking ahead to the reward in heaven. The Lord himself said, Hebrews 12, 2, For he endured, all, endured the cross and its shame, for his eyes were fixed on the joy of, of setting at the right hand of the Father. Paul, once again, back in chapter 3, I once thought things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all garbage so that I could gain Christ. Here is a man who had his affections set not on the things of this world, but on things above. This is where we've got to get our attitudes. So, this is what God wants us to do. To actively and intentionally set up our treasures in heaven. To live a life, let's recap, Philippians, what? 127, 2, 5, and 2, 15. To live a life worthy of the gospel. To have the same attitude that Christ had. And to be a light into a dark and crooked world. This is what Paul has been getting at, is that we are, to, we are to live a life that is worthy of the gospel. To point people to him, to be alive into this world, to have the same attitude as Christ. To be content in all situations, realizing who our God is. How does this happen? Verse 13, what did he say? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It goes back to Christ being enough. He's always enough. And so remember what Elisha said to Gehazi with his heart breaking. You remember what he said to his spiritually convict, conflicted servant? He said, verse 26, is this the time to receive money, to receive clothes and olive groves and vineyard sheep, cattle, male and female servants? He says, is this the time? He says, should you, should this be your focus? 
So I leave you with the same question. Should this be your, your focus? Is this the time to be consumed with what you don't have? Is this the time to be consumed with what everybody else has? Or is this the time to conduct yourselves as citizens of heaven? Is this the time to live as a light into a world? Is this the time to represent him well through our thoughts, our words, our actions, our attitudes, and our agenda? Paul's letter, what we've been talking about for the last nine, ten weeks, has been exactly this. Encouraging us to stay the course, to make a difference. And this difference is made by the life we live. And part of it is coming to the conclusion of, God, I trust you. Whatever I've got in my life is what you want me to have. So, I praise you, I glorify you, my attitude, my actions, my words, they show it. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, I thank you today for this journey that we've been on. I thank you today for this charge of content. Lord, that we can trust that whatever we have in this life is because you want us to have. You've allowed these opportunities, you've allowed this job, you've allowed this home, you've allowed this family, you've allowed this relationship. Lord, whatever it might be, maybe you've not allowed this job or this family or this relationship. Lord, regardless of whether full or empty, you're in control. Lord, regardless of whether it's a pleasant season, a disrupted season, there's a purpose in it, and you're in control. We are called to represent you well. We're called to stand on the firm foundation of realizing, Lord, that you have us in the season that we're in, that we're in this moment of life because you're going to work through it. We're just called to represent you well. We're just called to trust you. We're not called to like it or necessarily even or to embrace it. We're just to lean on you and just trust you. Lord, to do so with a good attitude, with good words, with good actions. And Lord, the devil likes to creep up and Make us discontent, discontent about our situation, discontent about the things we have. Lord, may we find contentment in you. There's something about recognizing, Lord, that if we got those things, Lord, it would be a step back and maybe even a disaster in our life. May we realize this truth. May we believe this truth. Lord, speak to every one of us as we're in your presence. Don't let one of us leave this place the same way we came in. Show us the areas in our life. May we're calling to be satisfied in you, to be more content. We pray these things in your name.